the piece that I'm about to present. So, um, hi everybody, Dr. Kogan, medical director of CIM, associate professor of medicine at GW. So we're gonna do a couple of things today. Um, I'm gonna show you an article, which I think is critically important for everybody to understand and review and actually quite a detail. So I think it'll take us close to 10 minutes to go over the article and then we'll do Q and A. And then if time left, I have a couple of long COVID points, including some updates about next week and also some of the um, sort of things that we've been uh, observing. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and you should all see a Lancet study titled um, Past SARS-CoV-2 Infection Protection Against Reinfection Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. You guys seeing all that? Okay, good. So um, first of all, let me just, before I drop into, this, into the careful assessment of this, um, so systematic review is a way of synthesizing multiple different studies. The meta-analysis is a kind of a step up. Meta-analysis is a way of looking at the prior control trials and systematically assessing the quality of data and making sure that you're trying to compare apples and apples, the problem versus apples and oranges. The problem with regular systematic reviews, when you're doing this, you're always comparing apples and oranges. And so the conclusion of systematic review can be skewed dramatically by uh, heterogeneity of the trials. Meta-analysis is, is a statistical uh, attempt at trying to minimize those, those heterogeneity vari variabilities that uh, obviously put the bias into the results. So what is this? So the researchers um, identified 65 studies from 19 different countries and then they kind of pulled it all together. Um, as you, you can see the results over here, but what I'm actually gonna do, I'm gonna go step-by-step step to show you. And particularly, I'm gonna also concentrate on comparing the past infection to the vaccine, which based on this data appears to be stronger than the vaccine uh, protection on both, on not just of, against severe, severe illness, but also against reinfection, which is a big surprise, I think for me, uh, expect that this study will be featured everywhere in the news in the upcoming weeks, um, and, and it was probably going to be triggered, triggering a bunch of controversies because um, you'll see in a second why. Okay, so um, first of all, so this is funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is not a random organization. This is a very solid um, group of researchers who've done the work. Now, of course, before I go into analysis, it's a critically important question. If you had a past infection, how long will you be protected from that point? And how long you will be protected against getting the symptomatic infection and against severity of illness? So basically, and can you compare that protection of the first of prior infection against the vaccination? So I'm not going to bother you with methods. Now, those of you who are interested, I will definitely put the link into the chat if you want to see the whole article. But generally, this is a standard uh, meta-analysis assessment. The one critical aspect of problems with any systematic review, including meta-analysis, the inclusion criteria, you could easily drop out studies which are important. Now, I have not done my due diligence to try to assess this. This is the most difficult part of any assessment of systematic reviews. Which studies were included? Which studies were excluded? Can you compare that? And can you make some decisions based on what has been excluded? Because quite often, the data that's not in the study speaks louder than the data that's in the study. So let's put that as a side note. Uh, I can't really formally analyze this just because this is a very large amount of data. And so, you know, and they do talk a little bit about it. They talk about inherent risk of biases in the assessment like this. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of this stuff. Honestly, it, it's not essential. But you can find the whole list of all the studies here. Obviously, everything is 22 <laughs> because <laughs> it's all fresh, right? So it's new data. Okay. So this is the first critical slide, um, or not slide, but the, the picture. So you're looking at the previous infection. Um, this, each dot represents a particular study. So it's kind of a hard to see that what they're doing is this line that they're putting, that's the line that is estimates the average of it all. 
and you see how that's a kind of totally everywhere that's expected okay so let's move to the next there's not much else important here because i actually want to actually no that is important so uh what you're seeing at the bottom of this on on um on this line that's number of weeks so each one of these graphs goes up to over 75 weeks so the first is 25 first line is 25 this is 50 this is 75. So as you can see, if you look at the ancestral uh, or initial uh, strains, the first infection, even at the 75 months, you still have more than 50% average protection. So 75 months, that's a long time. So this is completely negate prior idea that somehow after three or six months, your protection from prior infection is gone. Completely not true according to this. Now, Omicron did not do very well. As you can see that that is about a third protection, but again, this is 75 months. The way they describe this, they put an, a, a critical point of 40 weeks. I am not 100% clear why they did this, except that maybe 40 weeks sits right here where you, you see this precipitous line and then it levels off at kind of about 30, 35% protection left, so not much. Now, this is against, uh, it reinfection okay so symptomatic reinfection this is not against serious illness this is serious illness here this is almost more than 80 percent even at this point which is about 60 months 60 months is a is is a you know is it a month or is it the weeks weeks apologies this is weeks not months so 75 weeks so this is at the 60 weeks there is still nearly 80 percent protection here against severe illness okay okay so that's um and that's against prior infections the omicron it's even higher no uh sorry here omicron it's even higher what's i what i find is really interesting is there appears to be a beginning of a drop at around week of 40. That's, I think that's what the critical aspect of the study. They're basically saying until week of 40, you appear to be completely protected against severe illness, okay? And then something happens here. So of course, I hope that the same group a year from now will do the same exact analysis to try to simply extend this point to, you know, way over a year because here they stopped at just over a year and that's simply because they don't have enough data sets right i mean we haven't had disease long enough but this is very encouraging now and i'm gonna go straight to even more important slide and that's this now it's a little hard to see here past infection is this line it's kind of a green and and black i already tried to make uh, let me try to make screen a little bit bigger you may be able to see okay let's just concentrate first on this graph and then i'll try to come back so you see this is the a natural infection and then this is let's just take pfizer the green line and moderna this red line why they stopped at, at, at less than 20 weeks here uh, beats me i don't i don't know maybe they didn't have enough i didn't read carefully why some of the slides um they didn't analyze the against the vaccines long enough so you, they just because they concentrated obviously on the natural infection but this is the against ancestral alpha or delta the natural infections did dramatically better than vaccines it's not even comparable i mean the vaccines here by the week uh 50 i believe this is let me just make sure i'm not uh week 40 so this was week 40 by the week 40 here protection from um Pfizer was at about 30 percent maybe 40 protection from uh, past infection was still way above 50 percent okay so I'm going to make it smaller and show you this side of the so now this is Omicron because obviously this is more important for us since we don't really see this anymore so here nobody did well bottom line of the slide right so you can see that this is the natural protection when after 40 weeks it, it was way under 50 percent but it was still holding close to 40 percent and this was kind of similar to Pfizer and way better than Moderna so based on this actually the most practical point I took everybody get Pfizer 
right? Because Pfizer seems to be performing against um, Omicron better, dramatically better than, than Moderna. Why Moderna? And, and I'm sure this is going to be more discussion about this, and they, probably somebody smarter than me will figure out why the Moderna didn't do so well here. Okay. Um, okay, and the severe illness, this is the most important part. So this is infectivity. So it means that if you were to get like me, let me give you myself. So I had the disease back in March, late March last year. So it means that at least until roughly now, I'm at about 40% protected against any symptomatic repeat illness of Omicron. Now, how am I protected against the severe illness? And this is why I think where the gold is. If you look here at week 40, it stated 90%. Look at the other vaccines, they're all dropped out. And the difference is large. Now, what they're not telling us is what, what if you combine natural immunity with the vaccine? Can you get over 90%? Frankly, I don't care. 90%, good enough. So I'm, as a young, healthy person looking at this, going to probably say, so because for me, it's important that my patients don't get illness if I get sick, but how much of this Pfizer booster is going to bump up my own natural immunity against getting any illness? I don't know. And until I know this, I'm going to presume not by much, meaning until more data is available, young, healthy people should not, who had an infection should not even get any booster at any point, maybe even a year after because there's no data. And actually there's data that it doesn't make sense according to this. Until we know that somebody will do analysis combining the natural immunity with, this, let's say Pfizer, showing that that combination will outperform natural immunity alone, right? So, so the, I'm just basing this on, on the effectiveness. I'm not talking about any side effects of anything here. It's just the... And now against the severe illness, which in some ways is even more important, um, I love the fact that now this is over 50 weeks, so year out, we're still seeing way more than 75% protection. But notice that there is a beginning of a decline. Now that decline is still very small. Uh, I'd love to see more data here as to what will happen. It may be, by the way, that collecting more data here will eventually become irrelevant if the Omicron will disappear, if we're going to end up with a new strain. They're going to have to redo this type of study over and over again as new strains show up. So in summary, highly encouraging. If you had prior mild infection, congratulations, right? Looking at this, that's what you should say to yourself. That's what I'm saying to myself. Um, and now it's even more controversial as to at what point should everybody get boosters. Me looking at this, highly individualized. If you're relatively healthy, no problems, I'd say absolutely no boosters at all, none, until I see more data. If you have medical problems and we want to try to get this as close to 100%, individual decision. I think this is going to be probably starting to get pushed toward a main CDC line young, healthy people, don't worry, you know, you're probably okay if you had the first series of shots, and then on top of that, you got a uh, uh, natural immunity from mild COVID, you're okay. High risk people, yes, boosters. What frequency? Now I'm less confident to say every six months. I'm definitely saying every 12 months, maybe even less, at least for now. So with that, Oh, that's pretty good. I took about lit, just close to 10 minutes. So I'm going to stop this part and check the chat and see if we got any questions. And I'm going to put the study in study link in there in a second as soon as I get myself reoriented here. If you're uncomfortable with typing in the chat window, you can unmute yourself and ask Dr. Kogan your question directly. Okay. And by the way, those of you who, um, I, I don't know if I said that. So this was published in Lancet. Lancet is considered to be a, the top premier article in the world, journal in the world, probably as good as JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine. It's an English journal. So, okay. Do we have questions? 
how does this explain how some people would be more prone to reinfection after initial infection? Seem contradictory to what? No, right? So remember what it looked like? Only about 40% you are protected at about, about reinfection. You're protected against serious illness at over 90%. But reinfection protection is very small, relatively speaking. So and of course, there's variability. There are some people who get reinfected and some people who don't get infected or reinfected at all. That was my second topic for today. I don't know if I have time to talk about this. There was a study last week about um, and the receptor in the lungs that may explain why some people never got COVID. But I kind of find that not as interesting because that test that that receptor is not clinically you can't clinically assess it so i don't know like i can't order it on the patient and end up saying oh good you're never going to get caught we don't have that um, but that explains why some people get it uh, less or more because the degree of expression of that receptor and if anybody savvy enough you find that name of the receptor it escapes me right now i have to click on an article to pull it up but Misha, uh, we're going to, sorry for the interruption. We're going to for, forego the wellness talk. So just keep talking, but yeah. you have a hard stop at 2.30. Yeah, well, that's that was my plan. Um, I wasn't, I, my, this is Im more important to my understanding than kind of quote unquote wellness, because I think everybody needs to understand that. So this would be the current most up-to-date information. And since this issue of when do I get booster comes up, it's so important that, that I Ab absolutely. About it. Um, okay, so for someone who never got COVID, is it still recommended to get a booster every year? Yes, I think that actually is very reasonable, right? Because um, now you could, oh, that's actually a really interesting point. I just thought of something. You could arguably say, wait a second, how do I know that I did not have an infection? I may have had it asymptomatic right? So you could theoretically see your doctor and say, hey, can I get an antibody checked both to the vaccines, but also to the native immunity, just so I know. Um, it may be a reasonable thing to do, you know, but it's not necessarily going to uh, fit this study because the study didn't look into that. The study just looked at people who had COVID who've been documented to have COVID, right? They didn't analyze the serologists to say, okay, this person had COVID because we found antibodies. That's not how this was done. So you may or may not be in the same boat as people who were symptomatic if you had an asymptomatic infection. Um, but I think it's very reasonable timing. I would say if you'd ask me what I would generally recommend, I say get a booster annually if you never had COVID and good for you. Um, but um, it may be individually. Uh, discussed. So if somebody has a lot of risk factors, like a poor immune status, uh, maybe a transplant patient or some severe diabetes or some other complications like, for example, cancer, I may actually opt for more frequent vaccination if a person never had COVID. Remember also, this is a general population. So um, the analysis was not broken into very specific categories. That would be a whole lot more research to be done to look to take this data look deeper in it and say okay who out of all these patients have cancer who have, th that level of analysis probably going to take additional months if not at all possible you know they may not even have the data like this um so okay it's a good question uh, this is very timely. Thank you. My whole family got our first COVID infection this past September. We were planning to get, okay, so if your family is relatively healthy, don't get your vaccine. There's no point, as we just discussed, right? Because unless, again, Monica, this is important, unless some of you or all of you have particular medical conditions that put you at the high-risk category, then you should talk to your doctor. But based on this, if you don't have, if you're let's say not over a certain age and you don't have a lot of risk factors, I don't see any reason to get six months booster here after your infection based on this. That's what. That's why this study actually literally going to change my practice, it, at least until I see something better than this uh, or newer, not necessarily better. And, and, and you will see that this will be critiqued. Why? 
same reason I mentioned when I started talking about methods. Uh, I'm sure that um, there's going to be a lot of critique to say something like this. How do we know that uh, you have included all the data? And also look at that graphs on vaccines. Why did you drop the vaccines early? So there's going to be problems. And I mean, every study has a problem. There's no perfect analysis of any kind. So, but none, nonetheless, to me, this is good enough for now because this is just robust. And um, I forgot to mention, I think the total number of patients in all of these studies, uh, they mentioned that somewhere, but we're talking millions of patients. This is not a small, small cohort. Um, and I don't know if I can find it quickly. So if anybody has time to look through the study, by all means, but... Um, but that, that, you know, you're talking about the large number of total studies. So the number of patients, total number of patients was very large. Um, so, and, and then you're also going to have to decide because most of the studies were done in Europe, but they did have studies in Africa and, and Asia. And, and uh, you know, for example, there's a study in Nicaragua and study in Qatar. So it's probably does represent a broad enough sample to cover, you know, all of our bloodlines and all of our ancestor, ancestral lines. So, okay, do we have any other questions? Is over age 70, but healthy? Yes, yeah, so, so anybody over 65 by default falls into the high risk category. So Mark, I recommend you talk to your doc, but you do take the study into consideration and make decisions. Um, but it is correct that, that the issue here is that age alone is the risk factor. Uh, one of us is a 49-year-old cancer survivor without the immune condition and diagnosis of tachycardia after COVID, and the other adult is 48 and mild asthma. Okay, yeah, you should check in with your docs because this is not like if you're, I think the person who's 48 mild asthma probably should be considered relatively healthy, especially Omicron does not tend to cause severe asthma or pulmonary disease. So you probably, that person's probably okay. But the person who have a history of cancer and autoimmune condition and had a complication of acute COVID, I probably would uh, consider vaccinating this person. Now, the question is at what point? Um, Monica, that's a hard question. I, I don't think I can comment on that because it's, I would need to know more data. I may need to get blood work. I, I may need, I will need to understand patient a lot better before I could make a comment whether I think it's safe or not safe to not get a shot here. I mean, if we'd go back two weeks ago, I'd say get a shot. I wouldn't even like talk about it. Now things with this study are going to be a little bit different, I think. Any reason why Pfizer vaccine would work better? Yeah, so I don't understand this. This, remember, um, I don't know if you guys can go back to the slide. I'll, I'll, I'll share the screen in a sec. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't quite understood why that happened. Um, where is it? Uh, I don't know if I can quickly find it now. Bottom line, the, the Moderna did, oh yeah, this is the Omicron infection. Hold on. Okay, so it's this like, it's this right window here under B. You see that the Moderna, this is the, this line, blue line. Moderna basically protection against Omicron, symptomatic Omicron went basically to zero at, at week 40. And Pfizer maintained here without hint that it will crash this way, maintained at about 40%, kind of similar to where the past infection sits. That's the only practical major difference here, in my opinion. Uh, like for example, for symptomatic disease, the lines are almost identical. So it does look like Pfizer protects against any infection a little better, but also here, um, 
well, here it's a reverse. So here is severe Omicron. It looks like that the Moderna did somewhat better here, but they stopped analysis at 20 weeks. So what would have happened from here to 40? Who knows? So there's a lot of holes with vaccines here. I don't think we can use this study for talking about vaccines efficacy at 40 weeks. We can only talk about natural immunity here, but nonetheless, there's some interesting differences, which, I mean, I think I was pushing towards Pfizer more anyway, to begin with, because of the quote unquote documentation of somewhat less side effects. Um, I, you know, I think this doesn't necessarily help me one way or another, but still. All right, last question. I have two minutes left. Let's see if we have anything else. All right, well, I don't see any more questions and we can then stop right here. And uh, Cynthia is welcome. Oh, before I pass it to Cynthia, since I think we'll just end at three. So uh, next week uh, at 11 a.m., we're going to have a long COVID open house. I think Cynthia hopefully will join us there too, or Nina. Um, so please come. Uh, I will put a Zoom link here, but also, if you need a link, email us. Um, we're also going to send uh, a blast email to everybody. Maybe Janet can also send it next week to your listserv at the office. Boy, that's a long link, but I put it anywhere. Okay, thank you.